Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin and I'm delighted to welcome you to this fall's Anna Maria Kielen Lecture, The Mystery Woman of Hollywood, Greta Garbo, Feminism and Beauty. This lecture will be delivered uh, by this year's Anna Maria Kellen uh, Fellow, Professor Lois Banner. Unfortunately, Professor Banner couldn't make it here to Berlin because of the shutdown, uh, but we are really delighted that she has pursued her fellowship in California and that she's been able to uh, provide this, uh, this online lecture for viewers uh, both here in Berlin and around the world. The Anna Maria Kellen Fellowship uh, is named after the daughter of Hans and Ludmilla Arnold. Uh, and uh, as um, those of you who know the Academy uh, will uh, remember, we are actually housed in the Hans Arnold Center, in the house that belonged to Hans and Ludmilla Arnold. The fellowship is funded annually through unrestricted donations by the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation and the descendants of Hans and Ludmilla Arnold who provided the American Academy in Berlin with its founding donation and who have continued to uh, support the uh, Academy with really extraordinary generosity for which we're all very grateful. Professor Lois Banner is uh, an emerita professor of history at the University of Southern California. She is the author of 10 books, including American Beauty, which came out in 1983, In Full Flower, uh, Aging Women, Power, and Sexuality, which was published in 1992, and the prize-winning Intertwined Lives, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, and Their Circle, which came out in 2003. In 1998, Lois Banner published Finding Fran, History and Memory in the Lives of Two Women, an autobiographical study of her personal journey into the Muslim religion. Her work has been published extensively, including in journals such as the American Historical Review, the Journal of American History, American Quarterly, Signs, and Cinema Studies. Lois Banner, along with historian Mary Hartman, founded the Berkshire Conference in Women's History, and together they published a selection of conference papers in a, a volume entitled Clio's Consciousness Raised, New Perspectives on the History of Women, which came out in 1974 and became a classic in the field of women's history. Lois Banner was also the first woman president of the American Studies Association. And in 2006, she was given the association's Bode Pearson Prize for lifetime achievement. Professor Banner has been a fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute, and the Australian National University. And we are really delighted that even though she couldn't be here, that she is still a fellow of the American Academy in Berlin this semester. During her fellowship, uh, Lois Banner has worked on her book, Ideal Beauty, The Life and Times of Greta Garbo, which uh, synthesizes biography with history, uh, discusses the discourse on Garbo, the history that surrounded her, and the seemingly sudden reversal of the dominant ideal of female beauty, that occurred in 1929. She will now share some of that work in the following lecture, and I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Professor Lois Banner, who will uh, deliver her lecture, as mentioned, from California. My project, Ideal Beauty, The Life and Times of Greta Garbo, combines my two main interests as a scholar. First, biography, especially of influential women, and second, the histories of gender, sexuality, physical appearance, and feminism. There are five parts to this talk to help you follow it. There will first be an introduction. The uh, second part of the talk will be on the photo that's in front of you. This is a photo taken by Edward Steichen in 1928. He was one of the greatest pho uh, photographers of the 1920s and it was considered a mark of fame to be phot photographed by him. So the second part of my talk will be on the Steichen photo. The third part of my talk is going to be on Garbo's career difficulties, which were substantial. Number four, the fourth part, is going to be on Queen Christina, which I consider to be her greatest film and really the height of her career. And 
the Queen Christina was made in 1933 to 34, and um, then she made a couple more films, and the fifth part of the talk's going to be on her little bit on her celebrity status at the end of her career. So let me begin with my introduction. When screen star and legendary beauty Greta Garbo died in 1990 at the age of 84, she was one of the most famous and wealthy women in the world. She had become a top Hollywood star in 1926 at the age of 21 when she made the film Flesh and the Devil less than a year after she came to Hollywood from Sweden. She retained that status of top stardom for 17 years until 1941 when she retired from MGM that's Metro Golden Mare, Metro Goldwyn Mare, her studio, at the age of 36. She then moved to New York and made no more movies. Rather, she became a celebrity, famed as a leading member of the international jet set led by Aristotle Onassis, the Greek shipping tycoon. As a feminist and a scholar, I have long been fascinated by the histories of feminism and of beauty as well as by the lives of prominent women. My biographical subjects have included Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who led the American woman suffrage movement in the 19th century, Margaret Mead, an anthropologist and public intellectual in the United States in the mid 20th century, and Marilyn Monroe, a Hollywood cinema star and symbol of beauty from the 1950s to the present. These three women form a disparate group, but their lives display similar themes, a sense of showmanship, a charismatic appeal to others, and some commitment to advancing women's rights. Greta Garbo offers a special challenge. She lived much of her adult life in the era between the two world wars, when feminism seemed in some ways to be in the doldrums. She never identified with the feminist group. The majority of her audience was in Europe, not in the United States. Many film scholars regard her as consistently playing in her films the romantic heroine whose life revolves around love and suffering for a man. I began to crack that stereotype about Garbo when I found out that she grew up in Stockholm, a center of feminist ideas, where Ellen Kai lived and worked. Kai was a major feminist thinker who was read throughout Europe and the United States. Garbo grew up in poverty, but she attended the Swedish Royal Dramatic Academy, one of Europe's leading acting schools. She knew the work of Henrik Ibsen, author in 1878 of A Doll's House, one of the major feminist works of that era. In uh, 1923, the great Swedish film director, Moritz Stiller, discovered her for films and starred her in his epic, The Saga of Gösta Berling. I read many of Stiller's films as feminist in intent, and I find him to be an extraordinary filmmaker. Uh, I highly recommend his films to you. Now I'm going to show some slides that um, deal with the early part of Garbo's life that are important in understanding the adult Garbo. Um, I'll get back to that one later. That's Diana Merrick. That's uh, another still photograph of her from the Woman of Affairs, and I will get back to it. So here we go. Garbo at 16. She is wearing uh, her confirmation dress, and I assume this is her uh, official confirmation photograph by a professional photographer, which is why she's wearing so much makeup on her face. She wouldn't be doing that <clears throat> in her regular life. She was confirmed in the Swedish Lutheran Church, which was the official Swedish state religion. Now, 
A couple other things about her. First is that she looks older than 16. Garbo always looked older than her age until she got to be middle-aged. And the other thing to notice about her is really how plump she is. Garbo's natural body uh, was plump. She loved to eat and she often gained weight. Before she came to the United States to uh, work in Hollywood films, she lost 25 pounds. She had always a lot of problems with her weight. Her body wanted to be plump, and she suffered from anorexia nervosa. She had a very bad attack in 1927 and had to be put to bed for a month and eat a lot of protein. But that's another part of the story which deals with her years in Hollywood. So here she is at 16. Uh, this is um, Greta with Mimi Pollock. Mimi Pollock was a classmate of hers at the Swedish Royal Academy. And uh, Garbo and she had a very passionate affair that started at the Academy and uh, lasted for most of the rest of their lives. Uh, probably not after Mimi married a man in 1930, but I've read and translated many, many of Greta's letters to Mimi, and they're filled with love. But they also talk about male relationships. Uh, uh, Greta Garbo was uh, bisexual with a very strong, how shall I put it, masculine element. She often thought that she was actually a man. Um, okay, let me go on. I'll come back to this a little bit later. All right, here is Garbo as Countess Dona in Moritz Stiller's The Saga of Gersta Berling. The date is 1924. And you can still see that she is heavy around the middle, but she has lost some weight. Um, okay, one more, I think. No, I don't want to go to that one yet, but you can see her here in her earliest starring uh, role in Hollywood. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, uh, Stiller did most of his movies in Stockholm. So here we're going to go back to the Steichen 1928 photo, and I want to do a little analysis of it because it becomes very important. I take the Steichen photo to be an indication of the powerful Garbo, both masculine and feminine, with a large nose, high cheekbones, and a look on her face of earthiness and spirituality, contempt and sor sorrow, but little sexuality, which is kind of surprising, except for the cupid bow lips. You can see those large cupid bow lips, which were considered sexual in her day. Other thing that about this photo I want to mention is there's no joy in her face. She does not look happy in this photo. She has also um, got her hair slicked back and held with the hands on the side of her uh, head, which actually replicates what was a very popular haircut in the day called the Eaton haircut. It was a male haircut. It was introduced in 1925, and it represented the height of the flapper masculinity of the day. Um, is she a feminist in the photo? I will get to that in a minute. I want to show you another. Uh, here she is. She plays the role of Diana Merrick. This is Woman of Affairs when that photo was taken. Look closely, and I think you'll see that her uh, makeup in this photo is much less than in the Steichen photo. Now, Garbo wore extremely heavy mascara because her uh, eyelashes were white in their natural state. She once called herself an albino, an person with unpigmented skin, but it mostly showed in her eyelashes. She had very long eyelashes. She put a lot of mascara on them. When she did that, they would um, produce shadows on her cheeks. 
Her audiences waited for those shadows to appear. They were considered one of her defining features. Now she's wearing a cloche hat. This is 1928, so the cloche is, is very low. It's got this brim. This was called the Greta Garbo hat because of the brim, and it started a fascination with the headgear that she wore in her films, which the public was always fascinated by. Um, now, is this um, photo of Steichen um, feminist? It certainly is powerful. Uh, to answer that question of feminism, I need to define what feminism was in the 1920s. In the interwar years, it differed from the women's rights movement that went before it and the feminism that followed it. After woman's suffrage was won by 1921 in Germany, the Scandinavian countries, and the United States, many feminists turned from political and legal goals to focus on ending Victorian sex restrictions. They called for trial marriage, free love, free divorce, birth control, and the single standard, a slogan for ending the centuries-old double standard under which men had sex with impunity while women were to remain virtuous. When Garbo first came to Hollywood, she was typecast as a vamp. And I'm going to show you the picture. There she is again in Women of Affairs in the cloche hat. And there she's 16 and all of those. There we go. Um, and she was typecast as a vamp. A vamp in the early film days like Theta Berra was a woman who was so sexually appealing and charismatic that men could not restrain themselves from having sex with her. And uh, when Garbo came to Hollywood, the MGM heads, Louis B. Mayer, decided that she would be able to play a vamp. And some of that decision was based on this photo taken by Arnold Genty in New York in 1925. You can decide whether she looks sexual or not, but they thought she did. She certainly is very, very thin, giving the lie to reports that she was plump because she wasn't at that point in time. You can also really see her high cheekbones and her sunken cheeks, which are a function of all that dieting, but they also will remain a function of her appearance throughout much of her life, and they get become ultimately very, very meaningful. Um, now, in many of Garbo's early movies, once she had successfully fought her typecasting as a, a vamp, which she did do, she plays a modern woman who tradi challenges traditional moral values. Even though Hollywood censors required that these movies end by approving heterosexual monogamy, she was not published for violating middle-class values. That is the case in A Woman of Affairs, the first one. Let's go back up to the, uh, the photo of her in Woman of Affairs. It was made from The Green Hat, a novel which was a feminist tour de force. In 19, then in 1929, she even starred in a movie called The Single Standard, written by feminist screenwriter Adela Rogers St. John's. In that film, she travels on a yacht with a lover around the South Seas. In the end, she remains with a husband and a son, but she isn't published, punished for having lived with a man to whom she wasn't married. In contrast to all other MGM stars, and this is very important about Garbo, she challenged the studio's dictatorial head, Louis B. Mayer, by engaging in a seven-month sit-down strike. After finishing Flesh and the Devil in the fall of 1927 to end her typecasting as a vamp, she did not want to play vamp roles. She wanted to be a dramatic actress and to play innovative roles, especially cross-dressed roles and even male roles. And the male role she really wanted to play was Dorian Gray in the picture of Dorian Gray. Given the huge box office, but she never did play that role, given the huge box office returns on Flesh and the Devil, 
uh, L.B. Mayer gave in to Garbo's demands. Profits were his bottom line. She lobbied successfully to play the central female role in A Woman of Affairs. So let me go on because I want to talk about my third um, part of this talk, which is career difficulties. Now, she had huge difficulties over her appearance. When she came to Hollywood in 1925, many people did not consider her beautiful. I was stunned to reach this conclusion, but it's overwhelming in the movie fan magazines and in many of the popular journals of the day. They, don't, they say she's not beautiful. Here we go. And a lot of the reason for that is that in the 1920s, the small woman was considered the beautiful woman. And um, look down at the bottom, beauty styles, like many cultural modalities, move in a dialectical pattern. And they'll move in a dialectical pattern in terms of all the features of the human body, including size. So the very tall woman is popular in the late 19th century, and that slowly moves to the small woman of 1920. And she remains what I would call hegemonic. She isn't universalized, but she's hegemonic until 1929. So I'm going to show you women considered beautiful in the 1920s. Okay, first is the flapper. Now the flapper is the adolescent girl who has rebelled against the Victorian sex codes. And she is dancing and drinking, going to necking parties, and um, le uh, leading a very free life. So this is a famous caricature of her by John Hill Jr. in Life magazine in 1926. Um, the flapper is usually caricatured when she showed in print. People in the culture find her very amusing, which is a, a fascinating theme about her. John Held Jr. is the major illustrator of the flapper. Uh, and Life magazine in 1926 was not the magazine it is today. It was, by and large, a college humor magazine. Now, this particular cover, which is very famous, is um, uh, illustrating and satirizing the Broadway nighttime culture in which chorus girls who starred in reviews were taken out by older men who would get seats in the front rows of the reviews and then would take them to restaurants, uh, fancy restaurants, and give them gifts. Uh, and uh, it was satirized most brilliantly by Anita Luce in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, the movie that eventually starred uh, Marilyn Monroe. Um, uh, but you can see the flapper, and this is important, the flapper has a small nose, little eyes, and uh, a very small head. That is characteristic of the way young women are supposed to look in the 1920s. And if they're dancing the Charleston, I should say that. And the Charleston is the dance of the 1920s. And if you've ever done it, it involves moving legs and arms to in particular angular patterns and is characteristic of the fun and frivolity that is part of the 1920s. Okay, what I've next? Oh, the chorus girls. Now, chorus girls are symbols of beauty in the 1920s. Um, they are in the Broadway reviews. There are literally scores of reviews on Broadway. They're uh, a sort of uh, uh, tailored around um, topical themes. And the girls dance, the young girl, the dance and sing. You will notice how small they are. The chorus girl on Broadway was not to be more than five feet, four inches tall. And uh, 
They look very young. She's not supposed to be older than about 23. And you can see their funny legs. Well, fat legs were in fashion until the late 1920s which is kind of surprising, but that's the way it was then. <clears throat> and they will dance, they tap dance, or they do soft shoe, the chorus girls, and they are the stars of the reviews. Reviews are popular in Europe as well as the United States. In the United States, it's the Ziegfeld Follies, that is the major review performance. Uh, in Germany, it's the Tiller Girls who do these kinds of performances. There's a very famous theater in London, so a gaiety theater, I think, that's associated with these chorus girls and the reviews. In other words, they are <clears throat> exist throughout Europe and the United States. And as I said, on Broadway at any given time period from about 1915 to about 1930, you can find as many as 40 or 50 review performances going on on Broadway. So there's for the chorus girl. Now, um, she's very small, very short. She can't be over 5'4". Uh, it's, it's in the, the rules for becoming this kind of a person. Oh, right. <clears throat> And many of the chorus girls are, in fact, go to, to uh, Hollywood. Um, uh, it, it is a, really a training ground for Hollywood actresses. And the producers go to the Broadway chorus uh, lines <clears throat> for very small girls. This is Mary Pickford, who's probably the greatest star in early Hollywood, she did not come out of a chorus line, but she had been an actress on Broadway. She was about five feet tall, as were many of the early actresses in Hollywood. They did not uh, exceed more than five feet, three inches. The producers, <clears throat> there are whole lots of reasons why they, they chose such short women for their films. There is the theory, which still exists somewhat today, <clears throat> that short people look better on film than tall people. Ah, <clears throat> now, the Broadway reviews also had <clears throat> a chorus of very tall women. They were called Amazons. And here's one of them. This is the very famous showgirl, Dolores, from the Ziegfeld Follies. And she's six feet tall. She marries a European aristocrat. <clears throat> These girls <clears throat> in the choruses of the Broadway reviews did very well in matrimony. And uh, the tall showgirls, very few of them ever were recruited to Hollywood. It was the short uh, uh, chorus girls that went to Hollywood. All right, but it was not only short girls uh, who had a certain cachet in the 1920s. As I said, styles of beauty can be hegemonic or they can be, um, they can be non-hegemonic, but still very popular. So here we get Dolores, Dolores is six feet tall. And here we get uh, a, 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 um, uh, a, an illustration from the 1925 exposition in Paris that is one of the most important expositions of the early 20th century. And this is the guide, the cover to the guide, and um, 1925, an exhibit of furniture, textiles, and photos that defines Art Deco style. Now, in the 1920s, Art Deco style is called um, art moderne, but it later from the term art decoratif um, in the 1950s, uh, art deco is taken from art decoratif and becomes the name of the style. And what interested me most about this um, exposition is that the wax and wood mannequins that are all over the expo are six feet tall. The obvious influence here is coming in from Modigliani and his very tall women. Uh, and uh, Modigliani is a major influence on some of the artists of the 1920s. But where it's really picked up is in the fashion magazines and uh, illustrators in the fashion magazines 
to tall women fairly early on in the 1920s. But you won't find that in the flappers who are uh, mostly in mass market magazines. Okay, now here we get Greta Garbo. And this is her body. I showed you her face which has high cheekbones and sunken cheeks. They've managed to uh, uh, more or less dispense with those, a very good cinematographer in this film. But if you will note, she has very broad hips and very broad shoulders in, this is a, this is a still photo from a woman of affairs. And the, it's the broad hips and broad shoulders that are very much criticized. And I'll read some of the criticism to you in a minute. And here's another uh, still. This is from her very famous Anna Christie, 1930, the o Eugene O'Neill play. It's when she's coming into the bar. And if you look at her waist, you can see that she has a very thick, uh, frame around her waist. She is um, five feet seven inches tall. They all say she's much too tall. She had broad shoulders and a chunky body. She was built like a man. In 1931, now here I get into the criticism. In 1931, reporter called her an anemic, over-slender girl with straight and rather stringy tress, tresses, a skin kiss to wash out pallor by the cold northern lights, shoulders too broad and angular for her frame, oversized extremities. They're always talking about her very large feet. Uh, I don't want to go into the into the. Uh, feet business, which continues throughout her career. They criticize her very large feet. Actually, her feet, from what I can determine, are maybe five, six, or five, seven. But this is a very small, a large uh, size foot at a time when um, uh, uh, Mary Pickford so shoe size was like a five, one. So um, anyway, there, uh, Greta is just for her day considered large, although at 5'7", she wouldn't be considered that large today. But she has a very uh, long-waisted body. You can kind of see that in this, um, in this film, this picture of her. And the long-waisted body makes her appear taller than she actually is in her films. Of course, she often is is partnered with a man who is shorter than she. That's another thing that Hollywood does. They do like shortness, and these men often will have to stand on boxes. Moreover, the racism of the 1920s was directed against her. We know that the 1920s was a particularly racist era, but what surprises me is that she's Swedish and is presented as so, although she is often called Slavic. That's what a lot of people think she looks like, but... There's a, a, a anti-Swedish rhetoric that is directed against her. Swedish immigrants to the United States were usually praised as a favored Nordic race, but an opposing belief held that they were lazy, dumb, and too tall, with a sing-song accent in English that made them sound very different. All these epithets were directed against her, while quotations from her were published in a fractured Swedish. I tank, I go home. Actually, I think I go home. A statement Garbo often made when she left a film set became a national joke. I don't quite see how that could happen, but it said all the time in the newspapers that it was a national joke. Film col columnist Luella Parsons, one of the most famous in the uh, column business, wrote that Garbo was the most criticized and vilified star in Hollywood. I can give you a, f a few reasons why that happened. The first is that Louis B. Mayer was very annoyed with her for having gone on strike for seven months Mayer did not like to lose any battles. 
So he may have contacted the fan magazines to get all the terrible quotes in them. That's one reason. The second reason is that as a star, Garbo uh, would not agree to interviews and she wouldn't give autographs. She felt that as a star, all she owed to her public was good acting, that her private life was her own. But in the 1920s, it was not believed. It was believed that uh, stars were made stars by the public and that the public was owed tremendous respect, autographs, and all kinds of attention by the stars. But Garbo was knocked down and hurt at the uh, preview of one of her films. Uh, it was actually um, uh, Flesh and the Devil. And after that, in early 1927, she would never again attend a premiere. She would never appear in public. She would never give an interview. She actually gave terrible interviews. I've read them all and they aren't very good. But she refused to give them or even talk to the um, reporters. Now, Mayor was only one of the problems. Another one was, insofar as I can figure it out, those uh, reporters for the fan magazines, the Hollywood fan magazines, had a lot of influence and even a certain amount of power. And they were very angry at her because she wouldn't give them interviews. They felt a star was required to give interviews. Now, the 1920s is a time period when Hollywood is very, very popular. There is no television. There, there is a uh, radio. Uh, there's radio, uh, and there's things like vaudeville. But uh, the movies are the major form of entertainment. Uh, uh, the uh, attendance at the new movies by 1930s includes millions and millions of people close to a majority of the population of the United States going to movies. So the film stars are really important. And the fan magazines are the major place to find information about the stars. And so the readers of the fan magazine believe that the stars should, in fact, give them a, a lot of themselves. And they will. There's the famous scene uh, in um, the Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West, when he talks about the mob descending on the star and tearing her clothes off and hitting her and hurting her. That that happened. It happened to Garbo. It happened to a lot of the stars, that their clothes would be torn off by the fans. I sometimes think the fans were not entirely certain that the stars were real people, but they did follow them and they there was a market in autographs, so you got an autograph, you could sell it. Fans went around with autograph books, and each star was supposed to sign in the name in the autograph, and uh, there was actually a market. And so that because Garbo never gave autographs, if you could ever get one for her, it was the highest amount of money paid for any other um, architect. Now, uh, Okay, I um, uh, let's see where I go from here. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. There you see the tall women who are coming into uh, the six foot tall Dolores who are coming into fashion by the late 1920s. They begin appearing in 1925, which is the height of the flapper craze. So that the next step is to start making the woman taller and taller. And by 1929, the very tall woman is again in fashion and the small woman has become subordinate in any kind of uh, element of style or beauty. So here she is again in her height, her tallness, and uh, that's Queen Christina. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, by 1930, Garbo's look completely came into fashion, all of it, even the facial features. Uh, it's complex what happened, but a lot of it has to do with the models in Paris, the mannequins for the couturiers who 
began all to come from Sweden and all to look like Garbo with the high cheekbones and the sunken cheeks and the look of aloofness and the look of, of frigidity. All of that came in with the, the models, which uh, whose look was kind of patterned initially after Garbo. And it was the very famous uh, designer in Paris uh, who um, introduced the very uh, the tall model with the high cheekbones and sunken cheeks, and it captured the day and eventually went to uh, the women outside uh, uh, modeling themselves. And a lot of this can be traced back to Garbo. She moves from being considered ugly to being considered beautiful from 1925 to 1930, which is one of the fastest shifts in standards of beauty that I know of in the history of beauty itself. Okay, here we go. Now, she has, by 1930, become considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. And she now has a lot of power with Louis B. Mayer. And she signs a contract in 1932 that makes her the highest paid woman of any salaried woman in the United States. And she also demands to make Queen Christina. And there you see her in a... Uh, a, a, a scene from Queen Christina. Now, Queen Christina ruled Sweden in the early 17th century, and Christina cross-dressed and was bisexual, pacifist, and reform-minded. She actually abdicated the throne uh, in the middle of the century because of her conviction that she wanted to be independent and her own person and didn't want to be ruled by older state statesmen who ordered her around. The truth of the matter is that Queen Christina abdicated because she converted to Catholicism. She didn't like Swedish Lutheranism, which was really very austere, but that's not in the movie. They miss all the Catholic part in the movie. In this particular scene, you see Greta Garbo cross-dressed. You can see the extent to which she looks like a sort of man-woman in those trousers. And uh, uh, actually, in this particular scene, she is calming a crowd who is uh, contradicting with her. They don't know she's Queen Christina. Everybody thinks she is a young man. Now, to my right, the man to my right, the dark man with the uh, mustache, that is John Gilbert. And Gilbert was the most popular male star of the late 1920s. He and, uh, he and Greta Garbo were uh, involved for a number of years. Uh, she never married him. Uh, she might have, but he was uh, an alcoholic and they had terrible problems with alcoholism in Sweden. She hadn't liked it in Sweden. She didn't like it in the United States. And so there was no reason that she would marry him. She did have some um, lesbian affairs while she was living with uh, John Gilbert. She was with him for nearly three years. And my take on that whole situation is that she really was in love with Gilbert and she would have continued their relationship forever. He was the one who ended it. The other thing about Gilbert and Garbo was that he gave her cover for her lesbian affairs. But she did have lesbian affairs and he had affairs while they were together. I believe that they had an open relationship and that's why all of that happened. But um, on the other hand, I do not believe, as many have argued, that there was no nothing between them, that he was gay and uh, she was lesbian. I don't think that John Gilbert was gay for a whole variety of reasons. So next we get, ah, this is the most famous uh, uh, clip from Queen Christina, and <clears throat> I don't have the best um photo of this, but this is the ending when she's on a ship looking into space and uh, her lover, John Gilbert, as uh, the Spanish 
Count Antonio has uh, been killed and she is sailing off. We don't know where to with that extraordinary expression on her face. She was exquisite in close-ups and they did as many close-ups of her as possible. This is one of the most famous scenes in film uh, as she uh, takes the ship alone by herself. We don't know where she's going to, probably to Spain, which is where Antonio comes from. But you can see that exquisite look on her face. It's like the look that's in the Steichen photo. She looks sad. She looks aristocratic. She looks many things as the close-up goes on. It's also a pretty long close-up in films. It goes on, I believe, for nearly a minute. She's on the bow of a ship. So that's the... Um, Queen Christina uh, slides. So um, Queen Christina, unfortunately, was not a success, although there is evidence that Meyer doctored the books to make it seem a failure. L.B. Meyer was homophobic and he wanted to be in control of everything and he'd wanted this film to end differently and Garbo got her way by a series of maneuvers. But it's not really Meyer that uh, destroys this film. It is the Hollywood Production Board. That's its censorship agency. It was taken by conservative Catholics, taken over by conservative Catholics in the summer of 1934. And they removed Queen Christina from the screen as well as most of Garbo's movies that were still in circulation. Okay, so we come to the end of the slideshow, and so I just want to talk about my fifth point, which is about the end of her life and her celebrity period. Now, I haven't mentioned this, but it's true. Garber was very shy and lacked self-confidence. After Queen Christina and what appeared to be its failure, she gave up trying to effect any reform in Hollywood. I look on Queen Christina and uh, on her fight against L.B. Mayer and her attainment of this massive salary as, um, uh, on her part, great efforts at reform. And um, I believe had Stiller lived, that there would have been much more of that because he was a man of supreme confidence and ego. After Queen Christina, she did what the studio wanted. She was neurotic. She got in, into her head that the one thing that would make her happy was to be a wealthy woman to live in a castle on her own money. She wanted to be independently wealthy. So she continued on after Christina to make a series of period dramas in which she does suffer over the love of a man. The most famous of those period dramas is Camille the story of a French courtesan who um, has tuberculosis and is in love with a love uh, young man. It comes from La Dame aux Camélia by um, Dumas Fils, and uh, it was a, a, a vehicle that all the major actors of the ninth, actresses of the 19th century acted in. Now, once she left. Stockholm, uh, Garbo never acted on the stage, and it was always considered a major strike against her greatness as an actress. The problem being that she was very neurotic. I haven't really spoken about that, but all of that she did in Hollywood has to be seen against her basic insecurity and basic instability. Um, so always throughout this period, she would find mentors beginning with Stiller. In the 1930s and 40s, the screenwriter Salka Biertel, an actress from Germany, was her mentor. And uh, uh, um, I, I am not a complete fan of Salka Biertel, although I certainly do recognize what she did in terms of uh, helping uh, the Jews in the Hitlerian period and uh, trying to do some very innovative things in Hollywood itself. 
Nonetheless, Salkavir Tell, who ran a very important salon in Hollywood, did support Garbo and keep her going. Then, later on in the 1940s, uh, Gaylord Hauser, the founder of the whole food movement in the United States, became Garbo's mentor. She always found very interesting individuals to become involved with. And finally, her mentor was a man named Georges Schlie, who was an emigre to the United States from the Russian Revolution and a businessman married to the couturier Valentina. Now, Schlie left Valentina for Garbo. She really wanted to marry him, but Valentino would never give George Schlie a divorce. So Schlie and Garbo, although they lived together for years, some think in a strange menage a trois with Valentino, but I don't think so. I get I, it's more complicated than simply saying they were living as a threesome. I don't think that's so. There's much more about Garbo to be said, but I'm reaching my time limit. She was never a hermit. That is untrue. She was very insecure. She ran away from people. She often hid in, rather than seeing people, but she was not a hermit. She never said, I want to be alone, except in a movie or two. She contended that what she had always said was, I want to be left alone. She did not want reporters and her fans bothering her. But I haven't mentioned that she did have a fascinating fan base, that her fans were called Garbomaniacs. They dressed like her. They adopted her hairstyle, her cosmetics, and the way she behaved. I've done a lot of work on the Garbomaniacs and have come to the conclusion that they were a lot of young women who were uh, involved with other young women which it was a stage of life very common then, and um, that they responded to her masculinity and uh, the lesbian side of her persona, which obviously was known about in those days because it would travel sub Rosa from Hollywood and then slowly could be passed throughout the nation. Let me com conclude with one statement. Garbo found the fame she had craved as a child and achieved as an adolescent to be a Frankenstein monster. Although she had moments of great happiness in her films and her friendships, she had many, many friends, her final judgment on her life is tragic. She said, the story of my life is about back entrances and side doors and secret elevators and other ways of getting in and out of places so that people won't bother you. In the final analysis, Garbo is a monument to hard work and artistic talent and to the appreciation and mistrust of female beauty in our modern world. She suffered greatly from being so beautiful. She told her friend Anita Luce at one point that her beauty made her feel like a freak. Uh, it didn't give her what she thought it would give her, or certainly gave her a lot of uh, lovers. But on the other hand, her ability to keep love relationships going was not great. And in the end, I think those two, to a certain extent, turned on her. So my final conclusion on Garbo is that she was unhappy and that she was, although she was a great success as a film actress, she failed in her attempts to become a happy human being, which actually is not unusual among film stars. Fame is vastly overrated uh, in this world of ours as something that everyone would like to achieve because it can be, as Garbo and so many others called it, a Frankenstein monster that cruelly eats you up and leaves not a lot left over.